So we, we go now to this uh, run table on, 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 on the current situation and the future of development economics. And uh, um, we, we will try to make a, a some presentations and then open to the floor and, and, and hope we can have a good debate. Um, I think I will launch this with the following idea, but here you have very, very uh, sophisticated people that will have all the freedom and the degrees of freedom to, to go into all directions. But I think that the, this question addresses the issue of what are the topics of development economics and what are the means and the to attain this this uh, research agenda very basically we could have a micro macro uh, divide that could structure our discussion and and I will ask the the our participants to a bit explore this uh, this dimension uh, the macro that Francois gave uh, uh, a good share of time today seems to be a bit in the past of the current research agenda of a lot of, uh, of the young economists. And the micro that was in the past a bit or quite absolutely abandoned in the development economics uh, uh, um, agenda has taken the pace. Maybe it's a convergence factor. Maybe it is uh, an effect in intellectual life of, uh, of a rebalance of, uh, of, or a lag. Maybe it was a data problem. I was thinking that probably the issue is, you know, the first economics was monetary economics. Why? Because we have uh, aggregate data in the 19th century for, for money and for taxes. So we could do something with that, the economist at the beginning. Then we complexify and we got a bit more data. Then the developing economics didn't have any data. So they started only with the monetary data and they followed. And now the data, the data mining has become so, so much better that the microeconomists find their word. Maybe it's that, or maybe it's an intellectual uh, bias. So the microevaluation passion, and uh, it's some people say of the old fashioned, this, is, this becomes cultural imperialism. So how do we set the balance in the research agenda? We need to strike a balance. Is it the problem that macro has got lag because of the macro foundations are weak, a discussion that we see in macro controversy, or everything in development all of a sudden depends only on institutions. Institutions are mainly exogenous, so somewhat the rest will have to adjust, and this is also a recent fashion. Example, in the political scene, south, south and north, the market failure approach and experience leads to back to discussion on industrial policies. Should we go back to the foundations of industrial policies in a new, in a new framework? Should we abandon this? But industrial policies should be discussed in the old way or in the new way from a macro perspective. That means national champions, it resounds in France too today, or still popular, in certain, still popular concept in certain places in Asia, and in Brazil, for instance, big developing countries. Is it this a rule, or should we discuss horizontal rules for uh, industrial policies and come back with this discussion? The issue of governance in different places, different institutions, and different tools and different policies. Should we confront the windfalls of these policies in the developing world? But that goes beyond development. As I said, France. Structural drivers a la Roderick. How far, what are the means to discuss the types of problems of productivity that goes from macro to a sectoral analysis? Is it the optimal strategy in the past, the one that should prevail today? A new structuralist maybe should be thought. What about behavioral economics at the macro level, not only at the micro level? What economics and social interactions? Thierry Verdier can say a lot about this. Could we do macro experimental economics that is used today to macro, macro thinking, micro thinking? And then finally, the methodology of teaching economics. What do all this set of super specialists 
We have this discussion still, and very strong in certain places, that development economics should be a thing on its own. It's another theory, it's another practice, it's another word. Some intellectuals believe, north and south, that we cannot go from economics top down to different fields, and one has development economics as such. I leave all these questions for the 10 minutes of each one of you. <laughs> and you can go and say, as in the restaurant, whatever you want. But do it nicely. OK, and do it quickly. <laughs> no, 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 10 minutes. OK, no, I, I plan on five minutes, actually. So what I wanted to do was to try to use uh, a short period of time in order to uh, address the title question of, the, of this workshop is, what is the future of uh, the field of uh, economic development as a field of study. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I've, uh, first point I want to make is that we hear a lot about economic growth. I regard economic growth as an important part of economic development, but it's not the definition of it. To me, economic development entails the improvement in people's material standards of living, and we'll leave aside to non-economic development other aspects of standards of living. And so, uh, so to ask then, uh, what is it that can help overcome the constraints that people face to their material standards of living and be able to lead better material lives? That's what I think the core question of economic development is. Uh, Tito, you just raised the question of, uh, should we be thinking in micro terms or macro terms? I'd like to broaden the question to say, I personally think in neither micro nor macro, I think in between, which is multi-sectoral. And multi-sectoral is that there's a sector of, a, of an economy, there's another sector of economy, there may be 10 or as many as you want to have. Uh, each one operates in its own way, and they are linked to each other. So for example, um, the Lewis model uh, for which he won the Nobel Prize was a model in which there was a capitalist sector uh, they employed all the people they wanted to, but there were a lot more people available who wanted to be employed that the sector did not want to employ. So those people in turn responded by doing something. You know, they took action. What action did they take? They went and they crowded around the docks and they waited to tr uh, for the cruise ship to arrive and tried to compete against each other for a certain amount of work, the income from which they shared with each other. Is that micro? No. Is it macro? No, it's in between, it's multi-sectoral. And that model and Kuznets's model and the harris Todaro model and many others are in that space. How does each sector work and how do the sectors relate to one another? That's what I think we need to spend our time working on. My third point has to do with mechanisms for improving people's material standards of living. If economic development has as its goal people leading better material lives, then uh, what can be done to help them do that? It's sometimes said that there are people who put things in, uh, there are two categories of people, those who put things into two categories and those that don't. Okay, <laughs> I'm one of the people who tends to put things into a small number of categories, like two. And at the risk of oversimplifying, people's material standards of living can be increased by raising the returns from the, their employment, thereby enabling them to buy more of the goods and services they want. Or, and or, their material standards of living can be improved by the government uh, in the countries where they live, providing more goods and services. Most countries of the world have national uh, health insurance. My country does not, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but anyhow, that, uh, this idea of look at the labor market, and I'll be talking about uh, employment opportunities in my talk tomorrow, but also look at government provided goods and services. If there's no direct link from the policy under consideration to uh, either how many people are employed and how much they earn in real terms when they work, and if there's no direct link to government provided goods and services, then really we don't know what the development outcome of the policies are going to be. And I think we need to work on those direct links as part of our analysis of economic development. And then finally, my last point is to say that uh, pick a, a, a group. 
You may pick a region of the world, so we heard from Denis about Africa, or pick uh, a city, like the city of Detroit in the United States. It's a, an economic disaster. Or pick a group of people, uh, such as unskilled workers in the richer countries, uh, and say, OK, this, these, these, uh, who are, these groups are targets for economic development. Now, here, I think, is the fundamental question to be asked. What is it that, uh, what policies can be, can be formulated so that those of us in the richer parts of the world who have the ability to pay would want to buy more products produced by Africans or residents of Detroit or unskilled workers in the United States? Why would we want to spend our money on things they produce as opposed to things that the Chinese produce? Okay? Or that skilled workers in the United States produce in Silicon Valley, or French workers produce, or, or workers in the European Union. And if the answer to that question is we can't think of a good reason that, we, that, that people would want to buy the products made by those workers in those sectors, as opposed to the Chinese or the others, then people in those other parts of the, uh, of the economic world are in real trouble. So I think that that's the question that needs to be asked. Pick a target group and then say, what can be done so that those of us who have the ability to pay would want to buy products that they can make and that we would want to buy from them rather than from our own country's workers, the Chinese workers, or anybody else? I think I kept that to five minutes. Thank you. All right, let me um, continue. I think this is going to be uh, a, a mix of uh, ideas that are going to be put together, and hopefully we'll, um, you'll find it interesting to then uh, um, add your own so that you can have a nice exchange on this. Let me uh, also make, um, I think, f four points. One is, I think, first um, on why um, kind of macroeconomic type of analyses have declined in importance um, in some, uh, some sense in uh, developing economics. And that, I think there are some good and bad reasons for it. Um, one of the good reasons is that I think we actually, some of the important uh, macroeconomic um, relationships and fundamentals, we've certainly learned and incorporated quite well. And actually, we see it in developing countries uh, today. So I think uh, we know a lot more about how to achieve macroeconomic stability than we have in the past. And, um, uh, and as a result, the huge commodity boom that has positively affected um, uh, Latin America and Africa in the last 10 years has been much better managed than uh, 30 years before. So in that sense, actually, uh, macro, the understanding of these macroeconomic fundamentals has um, helped, has been put into practice. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, development is much more positive and stable in those countries. So in that sense, um, uh, we can, I think, to some degree declare victory on, um, on understanding uh, what it means to uh, achieve macroeconomic stability and how, uh, and, uh, how, to, achieve, uh, how to achieve it. Um, at the same time, I think this is uh, what uh, Carlos was, was mentioning, I think uh, the data issues has actually been one of the reasons, I think, why macro has uh, uh, declined, that uh, in some sort of sense the, uh, um, the way we are thinking about what uh, we believe as uh, well-identified causal relationships are harder to achieve at the, using macroeconomic data, uh, while at the micro level we are we're now uh, making much progress with that. Whether this is uh, a good development or not, uh, I think uh, is mixed because I think uh, sometimes uh, one shouldn't abandon questions just because uh, they are hard to identify causally uh, if they're important questions and we need to just uh, persevere. Um, the third reason I think why um, the macro has uh, um, f um, receded a little bit, which I think is also again a, a good reason in some sort of sense, is that it identified a bunch of constraints such as governance or institutions, and then when you dig deeper, you automatic automatically have to ask micro questions about how do these institutions work. You know, you can get so far with you know 
running regressions on the constraint of executive on the right hand side uh, and then you really want to know you know what it is exactly are these institutions and particularly an issue which we understand very badly still is how to turn around institutions we know that institutions matter but we for example we don't know very well how to turn a poorly functioning public sector into a well functioning public sector we know that privatization of some public functions may be one option but if we don't want to go that route and often that route doesn't solve many problems either um, do we, how do we actually make a public sector work better and that's an essentially a micro question which is Unfortunately, also very difficult to answer even with the best micro methods because we can't uh, uh, do randomized control trials or other things on that. Um, so uh, in that sense, I think um, the macroeconomic literature has identified some of the issues that the micro uh, people are now uh, identifying. So in that sense, I think it's a useful progression. Um, but uh, the second point I want to make is um, uh, we are... Uh, not enough doing enough of this uh, asking the macro question of the type that Danny Rodwick is asking I think uh, because uh, macroeconomic stability doesn't mean is not a development strategy it's the basis of a development strategy but um, and it's fundamental but it doesn't replace a development strategy and so the question of really how to uh, move about for structural change industrialization modernization those issues stay important and uh, even though they are hard to answer and they're difficult to identify, I think uh, from a policy perspective, um, they should receive much more attention. In that sense, I'm a, a big fan of uh, your research agenda and, and those who, uh, who follow it, um, because I think that uh, remains a, a huge issue. Um, the um, third issue um, that um, I want to uh, focus on, so in fact, I'll just finish with that then, is um, the... Um, Another area where I think we should be doing a lot more um, is um, that when we are thinking about these uh, big development strategy issues, we basically still think largely about growth and sometimes about growth and distribution. But if we think seriously about, if we take seriously about uh, uh, stuff that we've learned from behavioral economics, stuff that we've learned from the Stiglitz Commission, stuff that we've learned from what the OECD is doing uh, on, um, on the quality uh, of um, life, we basically have to recognize that uh, we really have to think much more about the quality of growth uh, the quality of, uh, than we, do, we have uh, in the past. So you know, my basic argument, for example, is um, that uh, the rapid growth we've seen in China in the last 10 years has um, the welfare enhancement that this has brought about is much, much reduced by the fact that it was accompanied by rapidly rising inequality, the fact that it was accompanied by a substantial environmental degradation, the fact that it was uh, accompanied by uh, um, an intense kind of social competition that is uh, generating. And um, so the question I think we have to ask ourselves much more seriously also as developing economists, um, what are um, um, the incentives that leads to outcomes that um, uh, are generating very, very minor welfare improvements, um, but are incredibly resource intensive, um, as, we've, as for example, the, uh, the growth experience of a place like China in the last 10 years. Um, and, um, and is there real ways to actually steer those incentives towards a way that um, we actually have, you know, in that sense, I'm with you on uh, um, that it's much more economic development rather than just uh, going for growth. And I think there we are just too, uh, uh, the literature is too separate. One is just focusing on how can we get growth going and the faster the better um, and um, let's get structural change and all of these things. But we really have to say how can we at the same time uh, have, the, uh, have the quality of that growth on the agenda, uh, meaning that how can we ensure that uh, it will happen with equity? How can, can we ensure that we put in place incentives to make sure that uh, um, environmental degradation does not increase, which you know, now is one of the biggest talked about prop, uh, topics in, in, in China. Um, and, um, and that is something where we're still not very far. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thierry, uh, you're a particular case that can uh, you and Danny also take back the the question by one of the participants that Francois translated to the rethinking the role of the state in the agenda of development. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
take me a little bit to improvise on that. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. On everything. Um, now, I want to just to mention, I'm going to get back to the issue of the state and the market just at the end of my, um, my talk. Uh, my five minutes or ten minutes. Maybe you give me ten minutes if I had to speak about the state and the market. But, uh, I wanted just to mention, to emphasize maybe, and I will re uh, in a sense I would agree with uh, what Gary was saying, is that in the development field right now, we have sort of this kind of view that there's a macro, the micro, and at the end, this is not really what is important to make substantial advances for the we material well-being of people. What I think is missing is that we don't emphasize enough the role of interactions, the role how to aggregate micro stuff to a level which is significant enough that we can make big changes. In a sense, I think that development is not about improving the well-being of people, but to improve significantly the well-being of people or to improve the well-being of a significant amount of people. So that means that somehow we, ha we, we miss in this, in, this, in this conference, we have the micro perspective, the micro perspective. I think actually what is missing, and it's quite revealing, is the meso perspective in between, and which relates really to the issue of how to make, uh, to build on what we know from the micro studies, from the randomized trial experiments and so forth, where we can really well identify what's going on, where we can very locally well identify the mechanisms and try to see how we can make that at a much larger scale. Why? This is the question of the scaling up effect. Why? Because if we want to have somehow some policy implication which is worthwhile to policymakers, we need to make sure that we can have significant counterfactual uh, capacity to analyze policies. And the counterfactual problem is actually related to the external valid validity issue. The external validity issue is that if we can run one particular experiment with five guys in one village, or 200 guys in another village, or 300 people in a third village, it doesn't mean that at the level of an economy of two billion people, we can make something going on. And that we don't know how to go from this local knowledge to a point where at least 100 million people can just take off from poverty and get to a level of standard of living that is close to uh, OECD level. That is still something that we don't know, and I think we should necessarily much more put effort on doing that, looking at interactions, aggregation, and, and whether this is aggregation and interaction between what we know very well, what are called proximate causes of development, we need to save more, invest well, stabilize the economy without inflation, and blah, blah. That's fine, educate people, and then maybe as well the deep causes related to institutions, culture, social interactions, and all those things, and we don't know how to make those two things fit together. And probably they interact, and they co-evolve, and we don't have any good analysis of what's going on in the medium term on those, on those issues. It's the same thing for local versus global. We all think all the time about what's going on at the level of one country. When we see all those graphs that Francois showed, we see all those regions going up and down but we don't think, but they are all part of the same planet. So what's going on? Actually, the big picture of the last 20 years is globalization. I'm gonna come back to that, but it's globalization and typically, and it's going back to uh, the, the structural view uh, expanded by Danny uh, today, is that, well, how do countries insert themselves in the global value chain? There is a major change that actually, we went from a situation where international trade in the 19th centuries for the developed countries was going through final goods, intermediate products, eventually migration flows, and now we are getting in a very completely different type of international trade pattern. Countries now are just producing in particular segment, and they try to move up the ladder of that segment over time and involve not only trade in components and trade in final goods, but it involves trade in services, trade in information, trade in knowledge, and all those features are interacting and intertwined together. And we don't know how to make that work, especially, for instance, when we think about this debate about the middle income trap. Those countries that get to a point of development, and now they get stuck. Why? Is that because we go from structural and they cannot improve their fundamentals? We don't know. But actually, that will have to happen within this new global value division of labor with all the complexity that is surrounded that, that, that kind of process. Now, getting to the, uh, the state versus the market kind of story. Uh, I think this is really something very important, of course, for development policy, the relative importance of state versus markets. I think that the development thought in the, the sort of the 20 or the 40 years 
started by saying, yes, after the Second World War, let's go with the state. Planning was fine. We had to coordinate activities, internalize externalities and spillovers, and go for it. Then we realized that actually this benevolent social planner that was behind our cost-benefit analysis didn't work very well. It was not so much benevolent. There was rent-seeking. There was a lot of groups trying to fight each other. And so we said, got rid of the state, because this is really bad. This is inefficient, and this is rent-seeking. So let's go for markets. And that's why the structural adjustment type of plan, the Washington Consensus. And that either didn't work. Now, people said, well, the state doesn't work. The market doesn't work. Let's go for something more local, social communities. And then we have those research, I'm going to speak about that tomorrow, social capital, communities, altruism. That seems to work, but at a very local level. And even that, we don't know how to scale it up. So now we are in between somehow. What tool to use to make development work? And I think, again, we need to think about this in a, in a sort of more uh, complementary way, how the three of them are interacting. Again, we don't know how to interact. How the state interacts with the markets and with communities. How to make that interact better rather than worse. And I'd like to make just one last point about this, which is about the role that we have as development experts in doing and advising people on policies. And that relates somehow to a fundamental question about economic analysis and social sciences more generally. When we think about constructing a model of the reality is just a model. In the model, we put some of our a priori, our beliefs of what, how the world works. And so somehow, the model is subject to some degree of arbitrariness, ideologies. Ideologies are fine if we can justify them and put them right on the table. The problem with that is that in the real world, we don't know how reality is. And sometimes, in the real world, because in the social world, we are not like atoms, that behave without expectations, but how others, we expect others to behave and others react to how the way we behave. Actually, when we think about something in our minds and we are sufficiently intelligent to make that thing consistent, then it's very likely that in the real world, the observations that we, are, we get back as a feedback confirm our a priori. In other words, that we are able to construct models of the functioning of society that are self-fulfilling if they are well constructed, and depending, of course, on the structural parameters of the, of the society. But there are situations where that happens. And this is all the more that actually we are not fully rational people, and that we are somehow trying to figure out our beliefs on the way other people believe as well. That's well that has been well exploited by uh, recent work on psych economic psychology by Benabou, for instance, by Roland Benabou, that shows that, well, there are two societies that can really well live totally and truly in two different worlds with different beliefs. The American society believes that actually hard work is what makes people move on. We should work hard. And if we work hard, we should benefit the fruits of our work and therefore not get taxed. And people that are actually poor, they are lazy people. And that's completely consistent. At the same time, we have other societies where we think that people are poor not because they are lazy, but because actually they have bad luck. If they have bad luck, we need to give back something to them. And as we give back something to them, we reduce incentives to work hard. So somehow, those two systems can coexist and can actually be self-fulfilling. And there's no way we can sort of say that one is better or worse than the other one. It's just a matter of an equilibrium situation of social beliefs and, organizations, uh, and social organization. And that's probably also the same thing. I wanted to ask this question to, to Carlos, but now I can ask him. What it could be that actually in Latin America at some point, the neoclassical world is completely compatible with a particular type of perception of how it works, and the structural world is also compatible with completely a perfect particular belief that we have of how it works, because we then we're going to have vice policies, and those policies may just self fulfill each other, and so the two worlds are exactly possible or plausible, depending on initial situations, depending on the social learning process that we have and the way experts interact with policymakers. And I think that that also puts in perspective this fluctuation that we have between the role of the state, the family, more generally speaking, or the community, and the market. And that, again, has to be put into uh, the way the, the uh, development agenda. Well, it's, it's getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> and now, <laughs> Danny Roderick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, there's so many things. I, I, I'm going to say it, just a few words on this micro-macro split um, because, you know, sort of the way I view it, it it's, it's vastly overdone. Um, and I, I should say I, it's, it's vastly overdone by, by both sides. Um, uh, I, I think one way to, to, to sort of see why is to consider that, that I think the, the two um, type of approaches are actually trying to answer different questions, and that once you um, try to push the approaches on the, under the same playing field where they're trying to approach the same kind of questions, um, I think they actually um, uh, not only have converged, but they've actually converged on, a, on a, what I think is a much more productive way of looking at policy. Um, what I mean by the uh, asking largely different questions is that much of the macro uh, sort of institutional uh, or sort of you know literature is really looking at the long run. Uh, it's, it's much more of a long run uh, kind of a question. Whereas whether they say it explicitly or not, all the sort of the RCTs are really very short run. They're just looking at you know impact effects. Um, uh, and, and sort of a parallel distinction is really that therefore the sort of the, the macro and the institutions are really much more about sort of the long run fundamentals, what I call sort of the fundamentals, you know, trying to figure out, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of human capital, is it institutions, is it geography, those are those big questions. Um, and, and, and the, uh, whereas the, the micro RCTs is, you know, they're not fundamentally interested in that and what, or at least what they're really doing is trying to figure out whether specific policies work or not. It's just very much sort of policy oriented, uh, sort of what works in the short run or not. Uh, so, so I would say that unless, you know, sort of that, 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 that in reality, well, if, you are, if you are to ask the question, well, let's just ask sort of long run is a succession of, of short runs. If we're going to get to the long run, we need to know how to move now. And so the relevant policy question within any policy makers, you know, sort of, you know, uh, horizon is, you know, what to do now. It's a short-term policy question. Um, now, for that short-term policy question, actually, you know, sort of these long-run macro kind of approaches really don't have very good answers, or at least they don't have very credible answers. And when you actually, you know, try to deduce short-term policy answers, you actually get to something that's much closer um, to uh, what the um, uh, what the, uh, the the RCT or micro approach is, which is you know that whether you're dealing with institutions or you're dealing with you know sort of um, you know how to improve incentives, you have to be very aware of the context and you have to sort of you know de you know detail your you know fit your reform to to the context, and you know by the time you sort of have actually turned into something that looks slightly operational, you know you, it's not that different. Uh, in fact, I would say that at that level. Um, there is this convergence, and the convergence, and I think the way that I would put the convergence is to, to, to distinguish it with what I view as sort of the old style approach to development, and I'm going to caricature a bit just to draw this distinction out. I would say that the old style approach was fixated on a big idea, and the big idea was that there is one big thing that developing countries get wrong. And in the you know 50s and 60s, perhaps it was that the big the markets get it wrong. The problem is markets don't work, and therefore you need sort of the kinds of things that Francois mentioned. You need the planning approaches, ISI, and all of that. Then we got the Washington consensus. The big thing was you know it was just that um, uh, you know that it's the, it's the government screw things up, so you need markets to work well. That, by the way, is is you know is reflected also in the micro literature because you know in in, in sort of you know, the big idea that, for example, everything, you know, the, 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 um, uh, um, the Soto idea that everything is, is property rights, that, you know, if, you know, give poor people property rights and you'll solve everything, or everything is, micro, is lack of credit. So give, you know, the mi whole microcredit approach, you know, give everybody sort of the mic. Now, what we have, what we have learned from the macro, as well as, you know, which we should have learned from the macro, and but what I think we've perhaps, perhaps learned a little bit from from the, from the micro, is that none of these things are really very helpful, you know, in terms of that. None of these sort of big ideas really work. Um, so the, the new approach is much more, you know, sort of a, a collection of smaller ideas. A collection you have to hold in your mind a collection of different models that might apply in different contexts. So in a, the direct implication is that, you know, that, that unlike the old approach, which had a big fix, now you really have to think in terms of small contextual fixes. 
Um, and, and so the whole policy approach is different. And then there is a third element in this movement, which is that actually the, typically the older approaches went with a bias towards a sense of best practice. That, that once you figured out what the fix was, then there was going to be some you know, best practice, how, how best to do property rights reform, or how best to do Washington consensus style reforms. And then you would sort of take this over, carry it out you know, across the world. And once again, you know, anybody who sort of, you know, the, right now basically the notion is, you know, the, the practice that works best is one that's going to be tailored to all the political, local political economy and all the various second best interactions at the local search. So, I think, so the new approach is one that sort of says that we have to be contextual, that we have to figure out which model to apply where, um, and, you know, let's get away from this long-term fundamentals, because if you're in a developing country, by virtue of being so far away from the frontier, you're in a situation where there's a lot of slack, so you can actually do small things and get big, thing, big outcomes out of that. But the nature of where the biggest slack is or where the big binding constraint is is something that's going to you know, change from time to time. And the way that you're going to actually implement these things, you know, have a healthy skepticism towards best practice, that you need to, maybe, you need to be a little bit more experimental. Um, so I think, you know, looked at it this way, um, you know, I think it, there is actually much more commonality between sort of what I would say sort of intelligent operational practitioners of the macro institutional approach and the real operational implications of the RCT kind of approach. But I think, you know, sort of really in a way that if I were to criticize, I would say that the probably the macro operation, the macro institutional people have to be a little bit more humble about what they actually really know uh, because, you know, sort of they fixate too much about it's just human capital, it's just institutions. Um, uh, and, and those aren't really well determined. And I think I would say that the micro RCT people really have to be a lot more humble about what they can actually learn. Um, and and uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's really these things, what they're learning are highly contextual um, uh, uh, effects and, 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 and we need to sort of do the kind of, of meso-analysis that, that um, Terry was talking about to connect them to um, uh, you know, some models at other levels uh, to really um, uh, make them more usable. Um, so let me just stop here. Well, this was, uh, we saved time. Uh, so there is time for questions. And I just retain uh, uh, something of the last uh, intervention, uh, and which is, uh, he, Danny said twice, humble for two tribes. And, and, the, and I, I, I adore that, that notion, but humility requires much more sophistication than conviction. And that, in terms of the analytics and the discipline, is a much more complex intellectual attitude, which is the gray and not the white and, and black. But I think this is probably the big challenge, and the, the putting on uh, one small side a piece, a piece after piece. But questions? Do I take to the?